Thank you, Jesus. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in. Cousin Kenny, Doretha, God bless you both. Lashonda, bless you. The Bible says, where there's two or three gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. And the Lord is in the midst of us tonight, whether there's few or there may be many. Hey, God bless you, Ben. Thank you for tuning in. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Not going to prolong the time. I got kicked out as soon as I went live in the beginning. It kicked me out. The video has ended and I didn't even click anything to end. I clicked to start. So Facebook is still having some glitches and some issues. But we're going to try to work our way through this anyway tonight. To do what God has instructed us to do and get through it and be done. Hallelujah. Last week we were talking about if the devil could destroy us, whatever he wanted to do, he would have done it to wipe us out a long time ago. But because of God's grace and his mercy, he covers us. The enemy cannot destroy your life. He can enable you to think negative thoughts. He can inflict you with things that's not of God in your mindset to make you doubt your ability to trust God and to keep from walking in your purpose. God has created you, but tonight, we're going to continue to allow the Lord God to tear down the walls in our minds that we build in ourselves as a protection. And that is usually administered by the baits of the enemy because of past wounds, past defeats, past failures, hurts and pains and afflictions and things that we have encountered in our life to so allow the enemy to enable us to doubt God is word, he's able to deliver, he's able to heal, he's able to redeem. So we get stuck in, in a dark place in our minds and, and God is trying to bring us out. The reason why the enemy cannot destroy you because God got his hand on our lives and it doesn't matter what comes our way. The words is having done all the stand, stand therefore with the full arm of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. So I encourage you tonight, Strap on, strap on your seat belt. Get ready to take off tonight in our lesson because God has a great lesson that we're, we're going through this book, The Bait of Satan, Living Free from Deadly Traps of Offense. Because there are many different forms of offense that take place in our lives through ourselves or through other people. Whoever we're allowed to inflict us is what will happen in our lives and cause our minds to drift into a dark place where we can't see light. When all we see is the darkness and the pains and the things that people have afflicted upon our lives. But God wants to set us free tonight. And tonight we're going to talk about how could this happen to me? How could this happen to me? And it's, and it's in reference to the story of Joseph, Jacob, the son that J Jacob loved the most out of all his children. He loved Joseph enough to make him a coat of many colors. And that coat symbolizes a covenant. If you really study the scriptures, you'll find out that was a symbolic of a covenant that God was making with Israel through the lineage of Joseph. So let's go into a word of prayer, then we get into our lesson tonight. So Father, tonight we thank you for being good to us, O oh God. We thank you for your mercy and your grace bestowed upon us. We thank you for revelation, for insight into the mysteries of the gospel. We thank you, Lord God, that you give us clarity and understanding from the word tonight that we'll be able to apply it to our hearts. And sometimes, Father God, we do get caught up in, in the mindset of asking questions. Why this happened? How come God didn't stop this event? Or why didn't God do this or do that for us? But God, tonight we come in the name of Jesus just saying, God, we know that you are the answer to all of our questions. We ask, oh God, that you give us patience, give us endurance, and help us to stand fast in the liberty of Christ that's made us free. We give you glory, give you honor, give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In our book, chapter three, how could this happen to me? How could this happen to me? And Genesis chapter 50, Genesis chapter 50, at verse uh, 19 and 20, Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 and 20. And it says, and Joseph said unto them, fear not, 
for I am in, fear not for I, let me read this again. My words get twisted of it. Then Joseph said unto them, fear not for am I in the place of God? Verse 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save such people alive. And if you know the encounter of the story of Joseph, you realize that Joseph was one that God handpicked and selected to be in a supreme position in Pharaoh's house. In spite of the afflictions, the imprisonment, sold into slavery, left for dead by his brethren, everything that could go wrong. If you read the encounter of Joseph, it went wrong. And we all can say the same thing, the same thing today that there are many things that happen in our lives. We're like, God, why? Why did you let me lose my job? Why did you let me get afflicted with cancer? Why did you allow blindness to strike me for a season? Why did you allow me to get diabetes and to get out of control? Why this and why that, guys? And we have many questions when things are not going right in our lives. Why did you let my child get killed? Why did you let my child get run by the car? Why did you let this incident take place to destroy my family, to wreck our relationship? God, why this, why that? And God is saying tonight that I am the answer. And you're going to find out tonight in our lesson that even though you have this question, just like Joseph said to his brethren, they decided when he told them about his dream, because Joseph was a dreamer, he told them about his dream, how his mother, his father, and his brothers were going to be bowing down to him. And because of the dream, you're going to find out everybody cannot receive your dream. When God gives you a vision, he gives you something that's going to take place in the future in your life, and you know that this is something you've been praying for, you can't tell everybody your dream. Can't tell everybody your vision because everybody's not on your side. Even those who look like they're for you, even though they look like they're, they're going to help you, going to be there to, through thick and thin, you'll find out that the very ones you confide in are the very ones behind the scene working to assassinate your purpose. And God says tonight that we have to be aware and be discerning of who we talk to. Who will allow to enter into our ear gates? Because when you allow people into your ear gates, that's when the enemy comes and begins to manipulate you through other people. So you have to be careful of what you're listening to to other people. Because everyone who says, I'm with you, is not with you. They're against you. You find this in the counter of Joseph situation. His brothers were against him because of a dream. It hadn't even taken place, didn't even come to fruition, didn't even manifest yet, but yet they hated him. And another reason they hated him because he was the beloved child of the father, Jacob, Israel. And because of this hatred and jealousy in their heart, they plotted, they planned for his demise. So guess what they did? They threw him into a pit. They left him for dead. Put some blood of an animal on his coat. Took it back to the father. Lied so that Joseph was killed by a ravishing animal. People are going to always try to plot and plan something for your demise. But you have to be aware that when you're on your way up, your haters are coming down. But not only that, but God will use your haters to elevate you to the place he has for you to be in ministry. Every born again believer has a call upon their life. And every child of God has a purpose. And you'll find out that when God gives you an assignment, you're going to have some haters. <coughs> it's okay for them to come in your life. Because they're there just like Judas was for Jesus. He was assigned by God to betray Jesus. In order for the redemption plan to take place on the cross. If he hadn't betrayed Jesus, Jesus would never have been put to death. We would never have been born again. 
So it all works together for the good. That's why I understand the scripture. It's so many different validation throughout the scriptures that says, and God calls all things to work together for the good to them who love God and are the called. That means you've been handpicked, selected, appointed by God for ministry. So you're called by God. Because you're called by God, you have an assignment. And in that assignment, is going to be persecution. In that assignment, is going to be some stumbling blocks. <clears throat> but when they come, don't allow them to sway you from your destiny. One thing I found out about a visionary. A visionary is an individual who can see further down the road. Just like you decided to you decided to um to open a business. And you go look out, you find the building, you know what type of uh, product you're gonna market, all these different things. You're visionary. So you see all this before you even put it together. A visionary not only just sees right now, but he foresees the future. That if I do this thing the way I'm instructed to do according to the vision, it's going to prolong longevity and going to have some, some, um, some endurance to it. <coughs> it's going to last a long time. But the enemy has a plan. His plan is to always throw a monkey wrench in your plan. So whatever God has assigned for you to do, the enemy always has people, his secret agents, I call them, sitting back, waiting on you to slip up. They're waiting on a moment where you're vulnerable. You haven't been praying, haven't been consecrated, haven't been seeking the face of God. He's looking for an individual who's in that vulnerability place where he can come in to distract you. I was praying this morning and I heard the Lord say to me, to every time you prepare yourself for morning prayer, the enemy is always going to try to bring a distraction. That distraction can be joint pain, could be a headache, could be an affliction of any type of sort that will come all of a sudden when you were fine when you first laid down and when you woke up that morning you were fine until you made your mind up to go see God's face. And the moment you make your mind up that you know what I'm about to get up I'm going to go to prayer I'm going to go on the prayer line I'm going to do this what God wants me to do all of a sudden all this stuff is going to happen. Your body starts hurting you get tired you get sluggish you, you can't seem to wake up it's like everything that can go wrong start happening. Why? Because the enemy knows that when you get in your position, he can't stop you. He can only delay you from getting into your position of prayer. So that's why he says we ought to pray without ceasing for the will of God. So I got to always have the mindset of a posture of prayer in my heart. In the first chapter, we grouped all the fence offended people into two major categories. Those who have been generally mistreated and those who think they have been mistreated, but actually were not. In this chapter, I want to address the first category. Let's begin by asking the question, if you've been generally, generally mistreated, do you have the right to be offended? That's a good question. In answer, let's look at the life of Joseph's favorite son, Joseph. I mean, Jacob's favorite son, Joseph. So, in Genesis chapter 37 and all the way through chapter 48, you find out Joseph's story. And the thing is, when things are going wrong in my life, or people mistreating me, do I have to be offended? Do I have the right to get offended? Do I have the right to respond to offense? I had an incident happen yesterday. A lady came into our building, don't even live here trying to get up to see one of the drug drug addicts in the building. And and as I said, I said, uh, you're not allowed to come in here because uh, whoever you need to see, you need to call them to come get you. She started cussing me out and swearing at me and just called me everything but a child of God. I ran back into the building right behind her and said, what did you say? And immediately the Holy Spirit checked me 
It says, don't respond with the natural response of the flesh. Respond with the spirit. I said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I said, whatever you said to me, I said, I command that spirit to come out of you in Jesus' name. Her whole demeanor changed at that moment because I did not retaliate with the same response she was expecting most people would. And I said, Satan, loose her and let her go. <coughs> and then immediately she went on into the building where she's trying to go but never made it to the person. Ended up having to go back outside again. I ran across her again. And she said, well, can you let me? I said, no, I can't let you build it. Why would I let you in the building when you just cussed me out? You just mistreated me. I said, no, I'm not letting you in the building. And I ignored her from that moment. And I, and I realized something, that the enemy going to always try to test you to see where your heart is when offenses come. That's why Jesus said in Luke 17, chapter verse 1, he said, it's impossible for offenses to come. Because they're going to come. Offenses are going to come in any form they choose to come into your life. But you got to re re be able to control your responses. So you cannot retaliate and respond according to the dictates of the flesh the way people come to you to offend you. When you walk in the Spirit and you allow the Holy Spirit to bring you to a place of temperance and self-control, you control your response. Joseph was Jacob's 11th son. He was despised by his older brothers because his father favored him and had set him apart with a coat of many colors. And this is talking about the, the dream becomes a nightmare. When your dream becomes a nightmare. God gave Joseph two dreams. In the first, he saw bound sheaves in the field. His sheaves arose and stood up right while his brother's sheaves bowed down to it. <clears throat> in the second dream, he saw the sun, the moon, and 11 stars, representing his father, his mother, and his brothers, bowing, bowing to him. He told these dreams to his brothers. Needless to say, they did not share in his enthusiasm. They just hated him even more. Isn't that something? When you feel God is doing something supernatural in your life and you're excited about it, you want to tell everybody about what God is doing in your life and what God has done, and they hate you. They despise you. They reject you. They talk about you. They slander you. And you haven't done anything wrong but to share some good news of what God has done for you. Just like if you were to walk out of the street and you've been praying for some money and all of a sudden you find a hundred dollars on the ground. God just bless you. Then you go tell somebody else about it. Well, it could why didn't it happen to me? How come you what makes you so special? How come you had to find a hundred dollars? I didn't find it. And that's how the enemy puts in our thoughts in our minds because we allow those things to happen to us. Shortly afterward, his ten older brothers went to feed their father's flocks in the field. Jacob sent Joseph to see how they were doing. When the older brothers saw Joseph coming, they conspired against him, saying, Here comes that dreamer. Isn't that something? How people would despise you for something God is doing in your life? They said, Here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. How many times you walked into a group of people who all gathered around and here you come and also everybody get quiet because you walked on the scene and in their hearts they go with that holy roller again they go with that Jesus talker again and then all of a sudden they start whispering what they, can they do to shut you up to trick you up or to tempt you to fall that's how the enemy does with a believer. He looks for any reason, any way he can come into your life to stop you in your tracks. Then we shall see what it will become of this dreams. He says he's going to be the leader over us. Let's let's try. Let, let him try to lead us 
when he is dead. So they threw him into a pit to die. They took his coat away, tore it, and stained it with animal's blood to convince their father he had been devoured by a wild beast. After they threw him into the pit, however, they saw the company of Ishmaelites, Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt. Then Judah said, hey, wait a minute, guys. If we let him rot in the pit, it will not profit us. Let us make some money and sell him to, as a slave. And he will become as good as dead and when and when would never be be, be again. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> See, he will never be he said he would be as good as dead and would never again bother us and we'll share his, the spoils. So they had came up with a plan, a plot to get rid of Joseph. And decided in themselves, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sell him to the caravan. And, and he'll never be seen again. That way he can't bother us no more. So they sold him. Check this out. They sold him for 40 shekels of silver. This is the same significance to Judas betraying Jesus. Because Jesus was sold for money. And we have to be careful how we allow the enemy to know our dreams. Because we tell everything to people, they're going to always try to find some way or another to destroy you. So Joseph had offended them, so they betrayed him by taking him away, <clears throat> excuse me, by taking away his inheritance and family. Keep in mind, these brothers who did this, same father, same flesh, and same blood. That's a shame. It's a shame how his own kindred turned their back on him. His own flesh and blood turned their back on him and decided to kill him. Now as America's our country is so different that it's hard for us to understand the severity of what these men did. Only killing him would have been worse. In biblical times, it was very important to have sons. A man's sons carries his name and inherited all he had. Joseph's brother kept him forever, receiving his father's name and inheritance. They blotted his name out, completely stripping him of his identity, all those familiar to Joseph was gone. So they knew that Joseph wouldn't have got an inheritance if they kill him. And so that's what they wanted to do was get rid of their brother because of hatred and jealousy. So we have to be aware, no matter where you go in this life, you're going to find some jealous folk in the house of God, on your job, in the streets, Go find some jealous folks just because of who you are. You might be the most happiest, joyous person. Somebody's jealous of that because they're not that way. You might be one of the well-extinguished dressers. Somebody's jealous of that because they don't have what you have. So we have to be aware that it's not you that they're after. It's the Christ in you that the enemy's attacking. Because the enemy once was in the heavenly place of glory and now I've been cast out and we're in that place of glory in the presence of Christ. And the enemy's jealous, so you're going to always try to find people of the same like-minded spirit to come against you. When a person was sold as a slave to another country, he remains a slave until he dies. The woman he married would be a slave, and all his children would be slaves. It would have been hard to be born a slave, but it was indescribably worse to be born in their wealth with a great future only to have been stripped away. So, you inherit blessings and favor, but yet taken away from you because someone decided to take it from you. Take away your power, take away your identity, take away your character, 
because of a thing called sin. When sin entered to the hearts of people, every inheritance that God promises in his word, you miss it. Because you get blinded by the sin nature. But when you allow the Holy Spirit to unveil your eyes to see what it is that's testing you, what it is that's trying you to get you to fall, and you recognize that I'm better than that. I'm more than that. Because I have the King of Glory living inside of me. I'm seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Therefore, I don't have to come down from where I'm at to minimize myself to these type of mindsets of people. So I can maintain a high standard of mentality in the presence of God. It would have been easy if Joseph never knew what he could have been. It was as if he were living as a dead man. I'm sure he was tempted to wish his brothers would have killed him. The point is that Joseph's brother did was evil and was very cruel. So everything they done was evil and it was cruel. And I'm sure Joseph like many of us today, when things happen in our life that we don't have the power to change, the most devastating things happen to us, we wish God would take our lives. I've been there myself. Why I cry, I said, God, why you let me live? How can you let me go through abuse? How can you let my life go this way and this direction? I wish you just would have killed me. Then I don't have to deal with the scars and the pains from it. But God never took his hand off our lives. He kept us in his will. He kept us in his purpose. He has a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11. God knows the thoughts and plans he has for you to prosper you and do you no harm and give you an expected end. And all you got to do is just trust God, believe God, and obey God. Trust, believe, obey. That's all we got to do in order to inherit the promises God has for our lives. Perfect hindsight. Perfect hindsight. As you read, as you read my <clears throat> excuse me, as you read my paraphrase of Joseph's story, you probably already knew the outcome. It is a very inspiring story when you know the ending. But that's not how Joseph's experience, experience went. It looked as if he would never see his father or his God-given dream fulfilled. He was a slave in a foreign nation. He couldn't leave Egypt. He was the property of another man's for his life. Joseph was sold to a man named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guards. He served him for about 10 years. He had never had a word from his family, never heard a word from his family, and he knew that his father believed he was dead. Their lives had gone on without him. Joseph had no hope of a father's rescue. Isn't that something? Sold to another man named Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh's army. Your father think you're dead because they haven't heard from you in 10 years. Your life is a wreck and there's no hope of ever seeing my father again. That's a terrible place to be. Talking about a hard place a difficult place, a challenging place. Joseph was in a, a true dilemma. He's in a true dilemma. Excuse the glitches. I don't know why I keep doing this tonight, but we're going to keep on going anyway. So he was in a bad place. I know people today who lost relationship with their children for various number of years, haven't heard from them, don't know where they are, haven't seen them in a long period of time, and it's hurting to your heart. But I want to encourage you, don't give up looking. Don't get up, give up believing. Keep trusting God in his word. Because God has a way of causing things to come full circle in your life to reunite you back with your children again one day. Just keep the faith and know that God has it in his hand. But at the same time that conditions were looking up for Joseph, sometimes very wrong was brewing in the wife of his masters. 
So something very, very wrong with brewing the wife of the wife of the Potiphar's wife. She had uh, cast a longing eye for him and wanted him to commit adultery with her. She tried daily to seduce him and he refused. And one day he was along with she was along with him in the house, and she cornered him and insisted that he lie with her. And he refused and ran out, leaving his robe in her hands clutched, clutched in her hands. And when he did this, she screamed. And she shamed and yelled rape. Isn't that something? How the enemy will use anybody in your life to come against you to trap you. And she tried to trap him in adulterous relation. But because of Joseph's integrity and loyalty to his God, he did not give in to it. Potiphar had Joseph thrown into Pharaoh's prison. Now Pharaoh's prison was nothing like our prison in America have ministered in several prisons as unpleasant as they are, they would be country clubs compared to the dungeons of Pharaoh. No sunlight or workout areas, just a sunken room or a pit void of light and warmth. The conditions range from cruel to dehumanizing humanizing to just degrade your credibility. Prisoners were put there to rot as they survived on bread and water of affliction. Can you imagine that? Being in a dungeon where there's no hope of coming out, no chance of redemption, and all you got to do is keep praying and trusting God. That's a hard thing to do. When you find yourself in a, in a situation in your life that seems like you're in a dark dungeon, it's like the light not shining in you. You feel hopeless. You feel abandoned. You feel like God doesn't care about you. God is still there. Even today in our lives, in our circumstances, situations, he's still there to bring you through it out. All of it victorious. Hallelujah. Prisoners were put there to rot as they survived on bread and water. They were given just enough food to survive so they could suffer. That's a shame. Just a little bit to keep you suffering. Make you, make you hungry. Keep you starving. According to Psalms 105 verse 18, Psalms 105 verse 18, Joseph's feet were hurt with fetters and he was laid in irons. He was put in this dungeon to die. If he, had been, if he had been an Egyptian, he might have had some chance of release. But as a foreign slave accused of rape, he had little or no hope at all. Things couldn't have got any worse. Joseph had gone as low as a person could go without being dead. Isn't that something? In the lowest place it could ever be in your life, and you feel like there's no hope, not even a chance of being redeemed or coming out of this situation. And yet God shows up in the nick of time to redeem and set you free. Can you hear his thoughts in the damp darkness of that dungeon? I served my master with honey and with integrity for over 10 years. I'm more faithful than his wife. I stay loyal to my God and my master, daily fleeing sexual immorality. What is my reward? A dungeon. And it seems like we all get in those situations in our lives where we're very faithful to our God. And no matter what we do, it seems like it's not good enough. I'm faithful. I'm loyal. I'm dependable. I'm always consecrating, always seeking God's face. And it seems like everybody around me is being elevated. And I'm being stuck in a certain position. Even on a job, pass me over for a promotion. My coworker gets a promotion. And it seems like the more I do good, the more bad stuff happens to me. I found myself in that place one time. It's like everything I seem to do good, evil's always there lurking about to make me feel bad about what I'm doing. And I found out that a lot of times, God knows if it's not time for elevation, he'll keep you in a certain position for you to grow even more in that calling. 
And the more you grow, he prunes, he perfects, he cuts away, he defines you by his spirit to make you better. I got this, this fire here bugging me. And the more you seek God's face, then when the time comes for elevation, that's when God will promote you. So I want to encourage you. Keep seeking God's face. Stay humble. Stay submissive. Let God stay in control. The more he's in control, he can handle it. Anything you're going through, he can handle it. He can make it work out for your good. And it seems that the more I try to do what is right, the worse things get. How could God allow this? My brothers steal my promise from God too. Why hasn't his, this mighty covenant God intervened on my behalf? How is this a loving, faithful God who cares for his service? Why me? What have I done to deserve this? I only believe and I heard from God. I only believe I heard from God. So we all get in those conditions of mindsets in the position where we feel like everything I'm doing, God, why? What's the use? What's the purpose? If the more I do good, the worse things get. Why do I even need to serve you? I'm sure he wrestled with these or more similar thoughts. He had very limited freedom in his life, but he still had the right to choose his response to all that happened to him. That's something we all need to take note of right there. In spite of it all, he still had a choice to choose the right response to it all. And that's what God is saying tonight. You got to make a decisive decision to trust God in spite of everything that happens to you because he's in control. Will he become offended and bitter towards his brothers and eventually God? Would he give up all the hope of the promises fulfillment, robbing him of his last incentive to live? Is God in control? That's a question we ask ourselves. Is God in control? When all hell breaks loose in my life, adulterous relationship takes, takes over my marriage, my children go astray, my body's afflicted, my family's divided, I lost my job, my finances are depreciated, is God in control? That's a question. Because we all have some form of encounter of offense. When things happen in my life that are beyond my control, my ability to handle, and I ask God, are you really in control? And guess what? He is. You just can't see it with the natural eye. But when you look in the spiritual eye and you begin to read the word of God, the word of God will give you the incentive of hope. The word of God will give you a different outlook on every situation that's gone in your life that God can handle it. And all I have to do is have faith the size of a mustard seed and God will fix it. Is God in control? I imagine never crossed Joseph mind until he had all, till all this was over, and that God process to prepare him for, to rule. How all this was God's way to prepare him to rule. How God would use his future authority over these brothers who betrayed him. Joseph was learning obedience by what he suffered. That reminds me of Christ. There was everything in the Old Testament. It points us to Christ. And Joseph's encounter with the sufferings, the abuse, the rejection is symbolic to the life that Christ will suffer to bring us salvation. And the thing that's so significant about this is that Joseph learned obedience through his suffering. 
He learned obedience through suffering. Are you learning obedience through your suffering? Or is it making you bitter? Are you learning to trust God all the more in your suffering? Or is it making you get out of control? Get angry? Get upset? But I found out if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle, victory, it shall be mine. That's a message to somebody right now. The victory is yours when you learn to let God teach you obedience in your suffering. And when you trust God in the midst of the suffering, his presence begins to cover your mind from every negative, foul thought of the enemy that will try to infiltrate your structure of your mind to make you doubt God. And God begins to build your faith in the midst of suffering that he got this. He's bringing you through victorious. By his stripes you're healed. He's still delivering you. He's still setting you free. And all you got to do is just trust the man's word. His brothers were skillfully wielded instruments. They skillfully wielded instruments in the hand of God. Would Joseph hold fast to the promise, seeking God for his purpose? Would Joseph hold on to the promise of seeking God for his purpose? Are you holding on to God for the promise he's giving you? The vision he's giving you, the dream he's showing you, the word of knowledge he spoke to you. Are you holding on to the promise? Are you allowing your mind to be distorted by the enemy to doubt God's word? It's very important as a child of God to hold on to the promises, the vision the dreams that God has given you. And don't allow the enemy to stop you from fulfilling the call in your life. Perhaps when Joseph had his dream, he saw them as confirmation of the favor on his life. He had not yet learned that authority is given to serve, not yet set apart. Often in these training periods, we focus on the impossibility of, the, of our circumstance instead of the greatness of God. That's, that's a true statement right there. Often in these training periods, your circumstances, your trials, your tests, your hardships, your disappointments, when your change is strange and you don't know what's happening next, how you gonna get through a certain situation, how you gonna pay debts and bills, your training period. We need to learn how to focus on God who has the ability to bring us through it all. Oftentimes in these training periods, we focus on the impossibilities of our circumstances. So don't allow yourself to focus on the impossibilities. Focus on a God who's possible to cause all things to work together for the good in your life. Because he's great. As a result, we are discouraged and need someone to blame. So we look for that one we feel is responsible for our despair. When you focus on the impossibility, you look for somebody else to blame. When we face the fact that God could have prevented our whole mess and didn't, we often blame him. When we face the facts that God very well could have delivered you out of your situation, we blame God. How many times have you blame God for something happening in your life? How many times have you said, God, it's your fault. I didn't get that job. It's your fault, God. I don't have enough money to pay my bills. It's your fault, God. My health is falling apart. It's your fault, God. I got all this pain in my body. It's your fault, God. How many times we blame God when our car broke down? God, you had to give me a better car. I wouldn't have to deal with this. Why? Because the human response it's a negative response. Human responses are negative responses. Spiritual 
relationship with God gives you the spiritual response to trust God by faith to work it for your good. This kept bringing through Joseph's mind. I have lived in accordance with what I know God wanted me to do. I have not transgressed in statutes or nature. I was only repeating a dream God himself gave me. And what's the results? My brothers betrayed me. I'm sold to slavery. My dad thinks I'm dead and never come will never come to Egypt to find me. To him, the bottom line was his brothers. They had forced, they had forced, they had thrown, they were the force that had thrown him to a dungeon. And maybe he entertained thoughts of how things would have been different if he had had, had in his power when God would put him in position and authority to, seen in his dream. So Joseph could have very well planned in himself that when I get in position, I'm going to get even with them. I'm going to make them pay for this. They're going to pay for how they mistreated me. My brothers who put me in a dungeon, they did a cause why I'm in this dungeon, that it caused when I locked the way it is, they're going to pay for this. What if he had a thought that way? However, even in a dark place, Check this out. Even in a dark place, Joseph never doubted God. He still trusted God. How different it all would be if his brothers had not aborted his future. How often do we hear our brothers and sisters fall into the same trap of assigning blame? For example, if it, were my, if it weren't for my wife, I will be in ministry. She has hindered me and ruined me so much what I had have dreamed. If it weren't for my, weren't for my parents, I would, not have, I would have a normal life. They are to blame for what, what I am today. How, how come others have normal parents and I don't? If my mom and dad didn't get divorced, I would have been much better off in my own marriage. If it weren't for, weren't for my pastor repressing his gift, in me, I will be free and unhindered. He kept me from fulfilling my ministry and my destiny. He turned people in the church against me. So we got many reasons we can come up with excuses to blame somebody for what's going on in your life. And this goes on. Many other examples. The list goes on and on. Absolutely no man, woman, child, or devil can get you out of the will of God. No matter what they do, they do not hold your destiny in their hands. No matter what people do to you, they do not hold your destiny in their hands. Joseph's brothers tried to destroy the vision. They tried to destroy the dream, the destiny. That God has for Joseph, but no matter what they did, it could not stop the plan of God from coming to pass in Joseph's life. I want to encourage you tonight no matter what dream or vision you have, the devil cannot stop God's plan from being manifested in your life, coming to pass in your life being fulfilled in your life. You are the one who can stop it from happening. When you start doubting, start walking away, what God called you to do, allow yourself to revert backwards to the sinful behavior, sinful lifestyles, you hinder yourself from the plan God has for you. Even though God never changed his mind. That's something right there. God never changed his mind about the plan and vision he has for your life. We change our minds. And yet God has put in his heart, you're going to be something great, but you keep doing stupid stuff. Keep going backwards. And guess what? God is patient. He's long-suffering. He's gentle. He's meek. And he's waiting on you to make up your mind to come back to him. That he can fulfill the call and plan he has for your life. It's up to you to allow yourself to get back into place in God where you need to be, where you would not be hindered 
or delayed any longer from walking in your purpose. We're going to close right here tonight. And then we'll pick it up next week, the rest of it. Because this, this is a really good lesson. And I want to encourage you tonight. We're slaves to Jesus Christ, not slaves to sin. And no matter what people do to you, no matter they mistreat you, talk about you, slander you, accuse you, abuse you, they cannot stop God's plan for your life. You have to stay rooted, grounded, and plant it in Christ Jesus. And allow God to bring to pass your life everything that he promised for you. And it's a guarantee God's will will manifest in your life. So Lord God, tonight I thank you for your presence. God, I thank you for your word. I pray tonight, God, this word has not fallen deaf ears, but will encourage us to examine our hearts to see where we are when it comes to dealing with offenses. And that we allow you to purge, prune, and revive, and replenish, and refresh us, God, in your will. That your calling upon our lives will come to pass in full fruition. That we walk in the purpose we have been created. And you fulfill the calling in our lives and bring us to our destiny that's found in knowing you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. If you're in a place in yourself and you know you haven't been living right for the Lord, you might have gave your life to Christ and walked away, backslidden. God is married to the backslider. You might be one of those who don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you tonight to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowingly. Cleanse my mind, cleanse my heart, and come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I thank you, Lord God, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that, God hold you accountable for that prayer because you just confess with yourself. You want him to come to your heart and be your Lord and Savior. And it's a guarantee, the moment you ask him to come in, he came in. And he's going to abide with you forever. No matter what you do, you cannot take yourself away from the salvation of God. Because you didn't pay for the price, therefore you can't take it away. But you can hinder yourself from the promises and the blessing and favor God asks for you by continually walking in sin. So I pray that you find yourself a church home. Get connected to a Bible-based believing church and allow the Spirit of God to minister to your heart, to help you grow in grace and knowledge and wisdom and understanding of who God is to you. Anyone have any questions or comments tonight before we go? I want to thank everyone for coming in tonight and to this live. God bless you. I see quite a few people came on tonight. Hallelujah. I pray this is helping somebody. I don't know why my throat keeps getting choked up tonight, but it's okay. Maybe because I was spraying some bug spray and kill these flies that got in my office today. But thank you, Jesus, for healing. By his stripes, we're healed and we're delivered every day. So you all stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. You know that God loves you, and so do I. If you got any questions later on, you come across your mind, feel free to inbox me at Charles B. Emery. Feel free to inbox me, and um, I will answer your questions accordingly. You all be blessed on tonight, and know that God loves you. Walk in your purpose for purpose today. is a day to make it a great day on purpose. Have a good night. God bless.